this is Masha Kalanko. Yes, you are in one of the most intriguing uh, session in NFLF uh, is about API leaders creating racial harmony in time of unrest. So as we know, um, uh, racial uh, matters have been quite deep-seated. Uh, as far as uh, 100 years ago uh, with the Native Indians, um, and then uh, also with the um, slavery from Africa, uh, and with uh, Chinese uh, railroad workers, and uh, many, many other situations and races in this country uh, that uh, people felt that um, there's something uh, with racial relationship uh, that is not uh, uh, addressed. And, and today we have the uh, opportunity uh, during this, uh, uh, I would say the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, created uh, all kinds of issues and uh, with uh, uh, Black Lives Matters and with um, Asian Americans uh, who's being uh, blamed uh, for the uh, uh, pandemic um, or the uh, coronavirus situation in this uh, country. So there's a lot of um, uh, situations that we really like to address, and uh, this is really the opportunity uh, to do so. And um, so, if it's um, a matter that is dear to your heart, you are in the right place. And today, uh, we have four very distinguished uh, young API community leaders and they are elected officials that's going to share the point of view the uh, perceptions of what's going on um, and uh, maybe everybody work together uh, could come up with uh, something positive uh, for our future so uh, welcome again and if you have any questions go ahead and uh, 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 use the chat room uh, to write your questions and uh, uh, we will ask the speakers to um, address them uh, later on. So for now, uh, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, our speakers to uh, share about um, the journey, uh, the background, and uh, we'll give each one of them um, about three to five minutes to introduce themselves. So we have um, Andy Lee, um, a good friend, and who is a, a Contra Costa County Community College Governing, Governing Board uh, Vice President. And Andy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, thank you, Marsha. And, uh... First, I'd like, like to thank uh, CLUSA and AUC for organizing the event. And also thank Marsha and Qingbai for inviting me to this event. So like Marsha said, let me give you a little bit of background of myself so let the audience know me better. And um, I grew up uh, back in China and uh, area I live is one of the poorest uh, community in uh, one of the biggest uh, city in China. The city name is Tianjin. At that time, it had uh, 8 million people. Now it's over 10 million. <clears throat> so I grew up there and uh, I saw all kinds of crimes <laughs> in my neighborhood. And uh, when I went to one of the like, uh, elite college, I was the, the only one, I think, the first one in one square mile to attend the elite college. And after I graduated from uh, uh, college, I came to the US to pursue my uh, graduate study. 
And uh, after I moved to several places, I kind of settled down in Madison, Wisconsin, and I got the job. There was one point I remember very clearly, and at that time, I paid off my student debt. And uh, I started to ask myself, at that time I was about 30, I asked myself, hey, you know, what do you think about the rest of your life? And uh, I thought about two options. <clears throat> One option is uh, hopefully I can live here as a traveler. When I die, someone can carry my ashes, and bring it back to China, bury it there or I can think of this country as my home. I thought it would be miserable if, you know, live in a country, in a place for years. I think I at least have 50, 70 years to live. So it will be miserable to live as a foreigner or as a traveler. So I decided to take this country as my home and uh, kind of build my life here instead of still think about uh, China as my home country. So starting from there, I get more involved in the community because what I see here, yes, though it's not much always uh, discrimination, but still after work because of your culture, your language, your food preference, a lot of people still go back to their own community. And uh, to, for you, for me to enjoy the community, I need to help the community, build a better community so that I can enjoy and the future in my family can enjoy. So starting from there, I got more involved and uh, more active. And later I moved to California because I think California is the best in the US. Although it's uh, air quality make it kind of the worst in the country now. <laughs> and uh, so, after I moved to California, uh, there's the first few years I moved around, didn't settle that much. And then my wife and I built a house in ceremony and we started to raise the family. I get kind of more involved after we settled down. I started uh, uh, my involvement uh, with the Rotary Group. I joined the Rotary back in 2013, I think. And through Rotary, I feel that I know the community more, I get more involved, uh, participate, help the community. At that time, I have no intention to, or no idea to get involved politically. I mean, but I do vote every time after I become a citizen. And uh, back in 2014, because of a certain event, I got uh, to know a few people, including uh, like uh, CC Yin, Sandy Chow, Albert Wang, I started to learn more about this uh, civic world. With their advice and guidance, and uh, we formed a Papa Travali chapter, which covered the uh, Travali, the uh, Ceremony Danville, Pleasant Livermore, and uh, which city I missed? Danville. And uh, started, I think uh, we have a few uh, founders here. Marsha is a founding member as well. And with this uh, APAPA, and we get more and more involved in the help of the API. And one thing we are proud of is now we have so many API become active, get elected, and uh, also is this year we have so many API candidates and so excited. And uh, so after we started the Papa Travel Chapter and I learned that, you know, city has the, some appointment position. So I went to the uh, meet with the mayor, Bill Clarkson, and with his encouragement, and I applied for the Economic Development Advisor Committee. I got it. And then start from there, I served at the uh, School District uh, Parcel Tax Oversight Committee, County Magic Care uh, Commission. And back in uh, later in 2007, late 2017, November 2017, I met, I had a coffee with my friend. And uh, at the end, she told me, hey, Andy, you know what? Uh, since your group is very active, let's think about uh, 
talk about this position opened in 2018. So she went through the list and uh, in the middle, she pointed me, hey, Andy, this position open. Are you interested? You know what? At that top moment, I told her, no, I'm not. I have two young kids. That's more than enough for me. And I have no intention or I'm like never in my life to think about getting elected. But two weeks later, another case suicide in my committee in Windermere. So I feel I have to do something. And then with the encouragement from several friends, I decided to run. And uh, I think I made it with uh, many supporters, like uh, some people are here. And uh, so starting to serve the community. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you, Andy. Um, Later on, we'll have you share some more of your experiences. So next, uh, we have the Vice Mayor of San Ramon, uh, Sabina Zavar, to share herself and introduce herself. Sabina, Mayor, thank you. Uh, thank you. So thank you to CLUSA and uh, of course thank you Marsha for inviting us and getting us together on this amazing panel and really humbled to be on a panel with these amazing rising API leaders in the Tri-Valley, uh, Bay Area Tri-Valley. Um, so thank you. Um, as Marsha said, uh, currently I'm the Vice Mayor of San Ramon, California. It's a small town, um, if people don't know, east of San Francisco. Um, I got elected to office two years ago in 2018 um, as the first ever Asian American to serve on a council. And I have to say this was a meaningful victory for Asian Americans in our community where the population of San Ramon is 38% Asian American. Uh, and for us to be first generation immigrants to come and build a life just like Andy described here in San Ramon and to be serving in our communities now is a really, really proud moment for me, um, especially. Um, so what's my story? Um, I moved to the United States 25 years ago. Um, I was born and raised in Pakistan. I was uh, born in the capital, Islamabad, if people are familiar with that. Uh, and I moved at a very young age. Um, I went to college here had my kids here, moved to Alabama, actually Mobile, Alabama, small town uh, in Alabama, um, went to college at the University of South Alabama, got my degree in computer information sciences, had my kids, you know, all the things we immigrants do when we move to a new country, um, has my kids, raised my kids, um, moved to Scottsdale, Arizona um, after a few years. Um, and uh, started working in technology and really you know kind of started with my own business and then started working in in the corporate world um, and raising my kids like i said so really living a very normal immigrant life where we come here for a better life where we build our lives um, san ramon i moved here about 15 years ago uh, my kids were still fairly young uh, going to preschool and middle school uh, actually elementary school um, so started off volunteering in my community. I was the room mom. I was the, you know, PTA mom doing the website. I was driving them around, going to the soccer games, all of that fun stuff. Um, and, you know, at the same time, growing my career in technology, building that, working hard, uh, building a life here in San Ramon. Uh, when I moved to San Ramon, I had, um, I lived in a small two bedroom apartment. And over the years, um, working hard and building my life, I've been able to uh, move from one home and then another home that I built here in San Ramon. So um, I would say a few years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago, seven, eight years ago, um, I had an opportunity to meet with one of my friends uh, who was running for Congress at the time, Congressman Eric Swalwell. And when I met him, um, there was this um, suppressed, if you will, um, you know, passion to serve my community. So in Pakistan, I'd grown up in a home where my family uh, for generations had been very involved in public service. My father, my grandfather, 
Um, I grew up uh, with the Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto really um, coming to our house and watching her as a woman leader in a, you know, in a Muslim country uh, and admiring her and aspiring to be um, her one day. Little did I imagine that years later and so many, you know, in, in another country, I would, I would have an opportunity to serve my community here. So I got involved with a campaign, Congressman Swalwell's campaign. I said at some point when the kids are grown up and I'm retired from my career, I'll, you know, I'll run for office and I'll serve my community. Well, what do you know? When you decide to do something, when you're passionate about something, the stars just start lining up. Um, and I started really, you know, uh, getting engaged just like Andy. I think we met at the Rotary. Uh, you know, uh, somebody told me about this leadership program, which is specifically focused to help women run for office. Um, and that's where I actually met Olivia. Um, you know, we were, uh, you know, in that, in that program, which helps women run for office. And the unique thing about that program was that there were women from every culture, every background, uh, and we were kind of, you know, struggling with the same thing, how to raise money, how to run for office, how to balance this with our families. Um, along the way, I got an opportunity to then align with a lot of leadership programs here in the Tri-Valley. I know Marsha and I, Andy and Scott, we're all graduates of uh, leadership Tri-Valley as well. And so these programs kind of taught me, showed me how, how to get involved and engaged. So before I knew, I, and you know, I started getting involved more on the city level first. I, you know, from the PTA mom and the room mom, I graduated uh, to our transportation advisory committee liaison on San Ramon. Um, and then, uh, you know, after graduating from the Emerge program, the question was not when, but how. Um, and so in 2016, I first decided to run for office. Um, interesting thing I like to tell people, you know, uh, I was told it's not my time to run yet. I have to wait my turn. And um, as, as women, as uh, first generation immigrants, as people who are new to the community are often told that. Um, so I came well prepared with, you know, it's when you decide that it's your turn to run, when it's your time to run, you run because you want to serve your community. Um, 2016, I ran, didn't quite make it, but 2018, when I ran, I, I won uh, with a very significant victory. And it was really the hard work, I would say, over the years that I'd put in um, to, and the passion that I had to serve my community. Um, so like I said, that brings me to my journey today, serving as the vice mayor um, of the city of San Ramon. I am running to be the next mayor of San Ramon. And so um, I think it's just a journey of stepping up, looking for opportunities and building friendships along the way to really empower and enable your journey. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vice Mayor Sabina. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Olivia San Wong. She is the president of Alameda County Flood Control and Water District Zone 7. Olivia, uh, please introduce yourself to, the, uh, to our audience. Yes, thank you, Marsha. Thank you, CLUSA. I'm really thrilled to be here with everyone today. It's so nice to see all of you here on Zoom. Maybe one point, you know, in the future, we'll be able to get together again in person. Um, Yes, Marcia said, my name is Olivia San Wong. I'm president of Alameda County Flood Control and Water District Zone 7. And my elevator pitch for what the agency does, um, we are a special district uh, and we manage the, um, we, we basically manage for droughts and floods in the Tri-Valley region. So that's going to be Livermore, Dublin, Pleasanton, and parts of San Ramon. And when you think about you know, the 21st century and even 2020 and what we're experiencing right now here on the West Coast with our major fires and also the uh, unpredictable climate. I know a lot of the smoke lingering in the air right now is because of the lack of a marine ocean breeze coming in and that's causing the smoke to linger in our airspace. You know, we, we have a lot of uncertainty in regards to predicting the weather. I mean, predicting the weather has always been a challenge 
throughout human history, but I think it's an even bigger challenge right now. And so what really uh, drives me to want to be on our flood control and water district board of directors is to really think about how can we best plan for an uncertain future in terms of climate and weather and how do we plan for this extreme weather of droughts and floods. And for those of us living in California in the past 10 years, we went through a major mega drought and the likelihood of that happening again in our lifetimes is very possible. So we need to be ready for it and we need to continue planning so that everything we love about where we live in California will still be here. Um, and then on that note, when that mega drought ended in 2017, we had quite the storm season that caused quite a bit of erosion and damage and flood control issues that um, my agency also has to manage. So we're really at that extreme end of thinking about climate and um, planning for the future. And that's something that I'm very driven to be involved in and be a leader for my community. Um, a little bit more about my background. I'm from Pleasanton where I live. I grew up here. I uh, moved here when I was two years old and I moved from Livermore, the next town over. And um, you know, I, I went to schools in the area, graduated from Amador Valley High School, one of our local high schools. And while growing up here, I was a lifeguard. So I spent a lot of time in the water and swimming a lot of laps as a swimmer. And so I've always had that connection to water. Um, also when I was in high school, we did a lot of the creek cleanups for our, our local Arroyo. And that's something that at Zone 7, we also um, help lead the effort on because having a healthy Arroyo ecosystem helps us have a healthy watershed and helps us uh, better manage our groundwater basin. That's something I did back in high school when I was a part of the environmental club. So it's really great to now um, have that continuity in my life. Um, after graduating from high school, I went to UCLA where I got my degree in applied mathematics and I studied things like, um, you know, prediction models and chaos theory and thinking about forecasting in the future. So a lot of um, that mathematics and that science plays into climate science and predicting the weather. So there's a really nice connection there. Um, but also while at UCLA, I had the opportunity to study ancient Roman history and I also lived in Rome for a period of time. And what's great about that is the ancient Romans were really big in terms of civil engineering and aqueducts and built some of the most amazing water systems in human history. And what we have today here in California with the California aqueduct is the equivalent of what the ancient Romans did. And we should be so proud in California that we have this major engineering achievement and um, what's really interesting about going to a school like UCLA and driving north on Highway 5 to get back to Pleasanton is as you're going up the grapevine you do see the California aqueduct as the water is flowing down the hills and so it was such a neat opportunity to have that distinction of studying both the ancient Romans and then also seeing it in action here in California and at Zone 7 the agency of which I'm president of we really serve as that interface between um, the California Department of Water Resources and the California State Water Project and our local area and bringing, you know, drinking water to our community. You know, when I think about CLUSA and um, all of us who are here with Asian heritage, you know, I think a lot about uh, drinking water in Asia and I, I, I've traveled to many countries in Asia. My, my father's an immigrant from Northeastern Thailand, um, an area known as Isan. So our ethnic heritage actually is more Lao. Um, I like to say that I'm Thai Lao so that I can also have that connection to Thailand. And when I go there, you know, the, the, the situation's a little bit different than here. You can't put a glass underneath the faucet and drink the water. You have to boil it or have some other system um, to, to make that water potable. Whereas here in California and here within the zone seven area, we, we do treat the water so that's potable, so that's drinking um, water. And, and that's something that we really value here and within the United States um, as, as an option. And, and I was just looking on a map in Asia. I think the only countries um, are Japan, South Korea, and Singapore that also offer the same services of um, treated drinking water. And I know we're, we're, we're talking about our backgrounds quite a bit. So I'll also mention, you know, I am mixed. 
I always feel like it's, it's a little bit of a contradiction, you know, having a father who's an immigrant from Northeastern Thailand and our heritage is more Lao. So it makes us a little bit different from maybe all the other people from Thailand you might meet. But then my mother is Caucasian. Um, you know, she's blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, she's from Michigan. so very Midwestern. And it is interesting being mixed uh, and then saying I'm from Pleasanton. I, a lot of people don't always want to believe me that I'm from Pleasanton and they always like to ask where I'm really from. And I usually am pretty persistent about saying Pleasanton or I might mention, oh, well, when I was a baby, we moved from Livermore to Pleasanton. But if you look on a map, those are pretty much the, the, the same region of the world. Um, and, and then I have noticed, you have to excuse me, there is a train passing uh, outside my house right now. So you might hear that in the background. Um, and, and so I've noticed, so if I say something along the lines of, I'm from Hawaii, people will always believe me on that one, even though I've never lived in Hawaii. Um, I've visited Hawaii once in my life. Maybe I should go again. Uh, so it's very interesting to me how people want to know, you know, if you, if you, if you look a little bit different or if you're not part of this image of what people think uh, people from Pleasanton look like, they'll really press you, press you and ask you for more information. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my story at that. I'm sure we'll get to cover and dig deep into a lot of the different topics that I touched upon, so thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Your story is getting interesting. Um, now, uh, last and not least is uh, Scott uh, Roberts, who is the um, Commissioner of Community and Recreation in the city of San Ramon. Um, Scott, introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, Marsha, and thank you, CLUSA, and everyone for joining. Um, Olivia, I can definitely relate to what you just talked about. Uh, my name is Scott Roberts, and I'm a proud first-generation Asian American. I grew up in a biracial family, Asian and Caucasian, in what was then a much smaller and less racially diverse city of San Ramon, a small city just east of San Francisco, as Sabina mentioned. I'll admit that I mostly identified with the Caucasian side of my family due to the lack of diversity in the community. We didn't have Asian clubs or organizations to promote and celebrate our heritage. Similar to Olivia, my sister and I grew up with two blonde haired, blue eyed older brothers. My point here is that I didn't connect with that part of my heritage until I went off to college and later to work overseas. Working and living overseas, I experienced two different awakenings. Number one, to the Asian side of my heritage, I was able to experience how others live in different parts of the world and gain a true appreciation of my ancestry. It was an amazing experience connecting to my Asian culture as well as other cultures. I wanted to celebrate and be proud of both sides of my family's heritage. And two, the oppression of women and girls in vast areas of the world. Because I have a very accomplished sister, Olympic and World Cup gold medals in soccer, I had taken women's success for granted. It was actually this revelation that was the catalyst to finding my own voice. When I came home, I started a journey to empower women but I found that I didn't have a voice myself. So how was I going to empower others if I was unable to speak up and be heard? I realized I needed credibility. I needed to get involved. So I set out on this journey. First, I ran for and was elected to my HOA's board of directors and eventually the board treasurer. I became a school alumni association member, then eventually a board member, and eventually president of the board, currently today. As Sabina mentioned, I joined Leadership San Ramon Valley and also took city offered courses to learn more about local government. Because of these experiences, I was asked to join other boards, eventually leading to applying for city committees and eventually getting appointed as a city commissioner. I didn't just wake up and decide to run for office. 
it's been a step-by-step -step process. It's been continuous networking, building trust, applying again and again until I was finally noticed. Now, there's an opportunity to run for office and I absolutely feel ready to step up and lead. I feel it's my obligation to empower our API community and take our voice to the next level in my journey. So please join me. You can follow my campaign at votescottroberts.com. I think that this is, a, 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 this is an effort that we all need to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for all this um, inspiring uh, journey of uh, yours. Um, you are all still pretty young, so uh, it looks like there's a long journey ahead of you. And uh, you are speaking uh, with um, passion, uh, with, an, uh, with a commitment to make a difference. So I would like to ask all of you. So um, you are all um, in public service. Um, and uh, what are the general challenges that you are facing? And um, how do you overcome them? Uh, who, who would like to uh, just raise your hand and, and uh, share your experiences? Um, and, and actually, it could be both positive and negative, you know. It, uh, challenges could be a uh, lesson learned. So um, go ahead. So I can talk a little bit if, you know, if I can start there. Um, I think obviously some of the challenges, like I said, I am a first generation immigrant. And understanding the lay of the land and how things are done, uh, you know, there's there's obviously people have been there for a long time, they've done things and, and so really understanding and learning. And then getting elected to an office with, um, you know, where majority of my council members are uh, older gentlemen. And to be and to establish yourself as a younger woman on and really show up and, and show that you are just as qualified, um, even though you might be younger, you might be a woman, um, you might be of different ethnicity. And I think that's a challenge, uh, but that's, you know, I love challenges as well. And so whenever there's a challenge presented, um, I do take it on and, and I, you know, and you can see that by example, that within a year of being elected to council, I was in a, unanimously voted as the vice mayor. And that I take that very seriously that my four of my other council members, the mayor and council members put their trust in me. So building that relationship, establishing that relationship and overcoming uh, maybe the unseen biases which people may have because people like to put people in buckets. Uh, and sometimes we don't fit in all these buckets, but we, you know, we uh, have all these um, things that we're able to bring to, to the table and the perspective that we're able to bring to the table to become equals as we serve on our councils. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, who else would like to share? I can go next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can build upon that a little bit and talk. I, I like to talk a little bit more about the campaigning aspect of running for office. Um, particularly, I'd say, you know, the last 10 years, it seems people are becoming a lot more engaged in um, civic matters, which I think is a real positive overall. At the same time, I think there's a lot of um, rhetoric that can be negative and also uh, be a little bit um, difficult to always hear. Um, and my story is so interesting. You know, I, I was campaigning once here at the Pleasanton Farmers Market in, uh, in my neighborhood, our very cute downtown Pleasanton neighborhood. And I had someone say to me, basically, go back to your own country, um, go back to Thailand. And I thought that was a really interesting, and they were in my face, it was in person for them to say this. I thought that was a very interesting comment to make, having been born in the United States, having moved to Pleasanton as a baby from Livermore, uh, to be told to go back to my country uh, 
Um, also being of mixed heritage, it also felt very strange to receive that type of comment, I'll admit. Uh, but it's there and it's out there and, and some of it's very politically driven. Um, and I think that, you know, you, you have to have a very strong uh, sense of self and, and be ready for some of these comments because unfortunately I think they're going to happen. And if anything for us, you know, as API leaders and as elected officials, we have to help the others who are also campaigning to, to be able to manage through these types of situations because I think it's going to happen. That's so great when you mention a strong sense of self. So no matter what people say to you, you it will not affect you uh, emotionally. Well, you have to learn how to process it, sure. <laughs> It was really tough yeah. at first. It was really tough at first. Um, and I was a little bit shocked by it too. I was not expecting that in, in my hometown. I'm from here. I grew up here. Um, and that's just, I think politics is politics. That's probably the best phrase I can share. Um, and so when people are not nice to you, please do your best to dismiss it as politics. I, I think the other thing that, that, that's been tough too is, you know, people I've known since I was a young child uh, don't necessarily support me in my efforts to run for office. And that was really hard also to accept. Um, but again, politics is politics and you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna win over everyone and you have to learn who's going to support you and you know, be okay with those who aren't going to support you. And I know earlier, Sabina mentioned how she had uh, ran her first campaign in 2016. I too had previously run for office and did not win. And I think that's something else to prepare yourself for is it's, it's so important to put yourself out there, be ready for these types of comments and experiences, be ready not to win, but keep on going, be persistent because, you know, in the long run, it, it's likely to work out for you as long as you're, you're doing your best to, you know, build those networks, you know, be knowledgeable and be involved. Mm -hmm. That's so encouraging, especially uh, for the young uh, uh, leaders. Um, so Scott, you have a similar uh, situation as Olivia. You are born here, you are biracial. Um, uh, do, uh, how, how is it for you? Uh, when you grow up and do people um, have anything negative about your background and, and well, does it affect, does it, and also does it affect you when you are running your com campaign? Well, I was going to actually comment on that previous question. Um, you know, and, and I think that, so from what I experienced and, you know, growing up here in San Ramon, um, it, you know, it went from literally uh, a 5% uh, ethnic demographic situation to now. I mean, if you look at it today, uh, more of a 50%. Now, this, this, I'm not saying that this is what it's like around the country in, in other areas, but here, right, in my community, it has grown to, to half, you know, if, if not maybe even a little bit more than half of the community, right, APIs in this, in this, uh, in this community. Um, and so it's not a surprise that APIs want a voice and they're trying to find their voice. Um, but what I'm learning is that in order to have a voice, right, in order to have a voice, we have to have a seat at the table. And right now, this table is essentially the same as corporate America, right? And as Sabina mentioned, it's essentially run by older white men. Right. So, so what do we do? How do, how do we, how do we get a seat at that table? That's, that's the question, right? I mean, that's, that, that's how we're going to have that voice. That's how we're going to make change. That's how we're going to do this. Um, and so, you know, essentially what, essentially what I'm saying here is that, you know, our leadership in many communities, right? Like we see in corporate America, our, our leadership doesn't reflect what the, the makeup of the city looks like of, of your community typically will look like, right? So um, what, what do we do? And like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, everyone's gonna have a different starting point, right? Um, but I, I think one of the best things you can do is learn a little bit more about your community, 
get involved in your community, take some classes, take some courses that might help you learn a little bit about how things work in your, in your city or in your town, right? Um, by taking those classes, people that are elected, people that are appointed will see your face. They start to trust you. You're starting to show that you care about the community, right? And so when you start to show that you care about the community, that trust starts to build. So that when you go and apply for some, some type of city position, right? What, like an appointed position or some committee, they've seen you, they know you care, they know your heart is in the right place. You're more likely to, to be selected, right? And then you start working your way up from there. Um, so I think that that's really what I think, you know, th th those are the challenges, but I think if you, if you're willing to put in the time and the work to, to get involved, then I think we could all do this, right? It's, it's something that we can all strive to do. Um, you just, you just have to want it. And I think collectively we, we need it. We need that voice and we need more of us APIs at the table to help make those decisions. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Scott. So well said. And and Andy, how about you? You and uh, uh, an immigrant, and it's uh, has been a, a journey for you. And uh, what kind of uh, challenges you were facing uh, when you were running your campaign? Um, I think as I more talk about the challenge as. Uh, immigrants, just like uh, Sabina, you know, we were born, raised in another country, came here. I think the first thing is uh, we need to learn the system because we did not grow up in this system. Our system is totally different. And so we have to learn and understand this, how the system works and, uh, you, you know, the whole uh, system. The uh, second thing is because we're first generation of immigrants, and like uh, I think Oliver and uh, Scott, you know, for us, our family are more back in our home country. I mean, our sister, parents, uh, relative, they're pretty much in their home country. You know, when you run campaign, you have all your relative here, through their relative network, you can reach a lot of people. But here, we do have that advantage at all. So as a first generation, I think it will be extremely hard. But I agree with Scott, through participation, through education, networking, and involvement, and you build your network, it's not impossible. I think uh, we show that people, it's, imposs it's possible, just a little bit harder, I think, for us. Yeah. Well, uh, Andy, I know you uh, for a while, and then I know uh, the pain or, uh, that you have to go through uh, when people are prejudiced against you uh, uh, because you're um, uh, being a Chinese uh, American. And uh, how do you deal with those? Um, sometimes um, uh, it could be very nasty. Yes, when I ran my campaign, I did receive some nasty comments from my friends, not my friends directly, they forward to me. I know there's a club, they post me as a, like, although I'm MPP, they said you get all this one party support, also this is communist, they, because they know communist popular in China, they call me the communist. And uh, the good thing is, I think I have a good advisor. I talked with uh, my advisor, uh, Ceremon Mayor Bill Clarkson, and uh, he helped me a lot. He told me first things, I think when, just like Oliver said, you know, when you get attacked like that, don't be mad and uh, try to calm down. And, but we need to fight back. So I asked my friend and Bill Clarkson, he, helped them help me and uh, ask them to withdraw those uh, like nasty comments from the uh, social media. So for us, I mean, in the future, we will get more, I think, even you are get elected, 
And especially now with as the Chinese, you know, with the COVID-19, you got more attack. But don't be mad and find a way to fight back and uh, fight back hard. Mm -hmm. Great uh, advice. Uh, because a lot of us, including myself, uh, being uh, Asian Americans and uh, being in this uh, pandemic and uh, being uh, uh, sort of blamed uh, for this uh, the, uh, natural disaster. And uh, there's um, a mix uh, in the community, there's a mix of um, uh, fear, a mix of feelings of fear, confusion, uh, what am I supposed to do? Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, not believe that it will happen to, uh, including myself, to us. So you as uh, API um, leaders, what would you recommend? Uh, what do you advise uh, to our community members? And, and um, uh, how to deal with uh, adversities, how to uh, deal with uh, uh, people insulting you or even uh, become violent uh, with you. So any, uh, it's not an easy solution, but uh, you as um, leaders, um, what are your suggestions? start by saying violence is not okay. So if that happens, you know, please reach out to uh, local authorities and, um, you know, report this. And also in terms of making sure it doesn't happen again, share those stories. Um, that, that absolutely is not okay on either side, um, if you want my opinion. Um, and then I think, you know, in terms of our own in individual safety, you know, just try to be as cautious and aware and put oneself in a safe situation. You know, take a friend if you feel like you might be going somewhere where there could be a lot of um, this type of activity. Or, you know, it's okay to say no sometimes too. You don't have to go to every single event or every single um, invitation you have to say yes to. So if, if you have a intuition that maybe a certain group might not be friendly to you, it's okay to say no. Mm -hmm. So I think to add on to that, right? Um, one thing is very, very important um, to recognize that we're all immigrants. And to be able to tell people whether you're here, whether you were here 15 generations ago, whether you were here one generation ago, you're now an immigrant and a citizen of the United States of America, and that's why you're serving in office. So nobody has an upper hand on you because their family moved here 15 years ago and you moved here, uh, sorry, 15 generations ago and you moved here 20 years ago. So that's very important to know that this is a country of immigrants. This is a country, a melting pot of people that have come from all over the world to call the United States their home. Uh, and you belong in this land as much as anybody that, that tells you, you may have a different color of skin or you came later in the, in, you know, in the journey. So I think that's very important for all of us to embrace that, that we are here, we are, citizens and residents of this community, this country, and we belong here. And if somebody tries to question that or asks you about it, as you know, when you're running for public office, you kind of, the first advice you get is get your alligator skin out. Because people will say things, people will hurt you, but don't take it personally. It comes with the office, it comes with the responsibility and the answer or how you ever always want to reply back with that is talk about what is important to you as a community, as a resident of the city. Um, I had an interesting somebody during the campaign called me once and said, um, I'm just calling to find out whether you are a Muslim or a Hindu or a Jew. Um, and I said, sir, if your pothole needs to be fixed on your street, would it matter what religion I have? 
So that's kind of, you know, we have to look at that. We all live here because we want to raise our families in a, in a safe town. We all live here because we enjoy the community we live in. We care about our houses. We care about our, you know, we're doing working and we have our jobs. Um, so make it about what is important to us as a community. It does not matter what race we belong to, which generation we came here as immigrants. In the end, we all love the cities and the, you know, the, the state and the country that we live in. And we're serving here and giving up an important part of our personal lives to serve that. So always kind of having that hat on and, you know, embracing that and being able to explain to people, I think it, it starts making sense to people when you, when you give them those common sense answers. Mm -hmm. so, so Marsha, I can, I can, I'd like to add to that too. Um, I actually have a, a, a special sort of experience that was really life-changing for me, uh, to be honest. But first of all, and I'll, I'll even mention, you know, comment on, on what uh, everyone else mentioned, you know, obviously if there's violence, right, that's something to where you, you just got to get away from there um, and, and don't let something escalate to that. Uh, and, and you have to make sure that you, you really do uh, you know, watch for your own safety. Um, and as, an, as, a, as a small example of this, this was back in 9-11, okay? Um, this was right after 9-11 occurred. Um, I was with some friends staying up at my parents, uh, my family's uh, cabin. And we were out one evening and I was approached by someone who essentially I believe we, could, we believe was uh, intoxicated. But, you know, he came up to me and basically said that, you know, your people caused this, you know, 9-11 to happen. And I, I, I was just so shocked that, you know, first of all, uh, I, mean, I don't want to go, in, go into that because it's so absurd, right, to, to, to even hear that. Um, but I could tell that it could quit that situation could quickly escalate to something uh, of violence. Right. So I we got out of there quickly and, and got away. Um, and it was a it was a real eye opener to me. It was it was an awakening that I realized that even though. Right. I, I you know, I, I grew up here in this in this community. I you know, I I went to our schools here. Um, you know, I feel like an American. I am an American. Others will still can still look at you based on the color of your skin, and you know, uh, you know, uh, cause problems, right? And, and and this is something that really changed my life. Something that I said, well, you know, this is I, I really want to uh, do something about this. I need to be. I need to c get closer to my heritage. Um, I need to. I need to celebrate it more. And so, um, what I would say. Um, is that in these kinds of situations, right, we obviously don't want to promote violence. Obviously, we, we, we want to fight back, but we don't want to promote violence. But we also can't be silent, right? So what we should do is use it as an opportunity to build a repu reputation for, for building unity, right? So, so there, there's no need for violence. Why not take a step back? take a deep breath, use that type of situation as an opportunity. And I think that if we all do that, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll help make change. So. Mm -hmm. And Scott, that is so well said. Uh, Andy, do you have anything to add on this? Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree with uh, them, but I'd like to add more from the community part. Uh, what I see here is exactly for the Asian community, where more, a lot of people live in this more closed community. And that happened to me as well when, like many years ago, you know, after work, I practically live with my very close uh, Chinese community. I don't know much people like uh, even other API uh, friends. I don't have that. And, uh, you know, with a co closed community, when things happen, you will not get help. So what I, my suggestion is to go out and participate and get involved and work with other communities, help uh, 
the whole community, build a better community for all of us, not just live in your, like your own close community. When you work with other community and you help other people, and when they know you, when things happen, they'll be happy to help you. You know, the chance that if people don't know you have no clue who you are, what's the chance they will help you? But if you work with them, especially they see our uh, contribution to the community, we help the community, help the people, then when we need help, it's more likely they will help us. So I'm more encourage people to participate and uh, make the contributor community build a good community for all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I'm aligned with you. And I think all four of you have uh, uh, given us some insights of being API uh, political leaders. So, um, so do you think uh, API uh, leaders, especially the up and coming young, younger leaders like yourself, uh, will take on uh, uh, creating harmony uh, in the uh, relation uh, 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 in relationship with other races, or or take it on um, uh, to overcome uh, uh, some of those. Uh, uh, prejudice and discrimination, uh, um, uh, not just against uh, us, API, uh, but also um, among different communities. Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, uh, as I listened earlier, API, being API leader could be a, an advantage because we have a, um, a certain um, attitude, we have certain way of looking at issues, and we are uh, peaceful, uh, we are smart, I would say we are smart, and um, we, um, so I'd like to hear from you guys. So I think, you know, given the topic, racial harmony and the movement that we're going through, right, a very um, important movement in our lifetimes is the Black Lives Movement, which is happening right now. And we're, we're in the middle of it. Um, and what we have to understand that when we support others, we will get the support when we need it. And, you know, we've, um, Asians have been called out for not being, being too complacent, not aligning with the movement, not standing up. So I think one of the important things is that we create racial harmony, not just within the Asian community, but actually within the Black community, within the Latina community, within, you know, because again, we, we are all communities, like Andy said, if we stick to our little bubble, even if it's just the Asian bubble, we're not never going to get support from all the other people. So how do we stand up? How do we own, and in some ways, own the Asian privilege that we have to help other communities and stand behind them and really acknowledge and recognize? Um, I know there's been, you know, um, it does get controversial where it's the, you know, Black Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter. But the thing is, when you support the Black Lives Matter movement, where they have historically been, the Black Lives have been at a disadvantage, have been discriminated against, when you support that movement, other movements will get supported by default. Asians are a lot of us, like myself and Andy, are here because of the 1965 Act, which actually stands on the shoulder of the civil rights movement. So if the civil rights movement hadn't happened, maybe the Asians would not have had an opportunity to come and move to the United States and those immigrant acts may not, may not have been enacted. So we really have to we live harmoniously with everybody and understand that there are communities which are still being marginalized, that are still being um, you know, um, discriminated against. And how do we become one voice as an Asian community, um, as a black community, as a Latina community, as a white community,
become one voice to uh, for for all communities and really create that racial harmony amongst all of us. Um, mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much, Sabina. Actually, you open up this uh, conversation. Uh, there's uh, from the audience a Christian who is from Portland, uh, um, who is. Um, uh, asking a question about, let's talk about an issue like um, Black Lives Matter since the panel is about creating racial harmony. Uh, how do you think the API community could better work in solidarity and action with the Black community given how APIs might perpetuate, uh, perpetuate actually is perpetuate and time blackness in our culture, family, community, etc., including not only our complexity, uh, complicity, but also our indifference, silence to their suffering. So, uh, Sabina, uh, you opened up that uh, conversation and you gave uh, uh, us some insights. Um, do you want to add on to this? Um, and uh, uh, or other um, uh, speakers uh, could chime me in. I can jump in real quick. I, I, I have some thoughts and I see, I see this in the chat as well. Thanks so much for the question. Um, and I, I see there's also the point about how we can find common ground to work together. And I, I can personally say this is something I always strive to do, um, you know, as I'm trying to build consensus and trying to build goodwill is, you know, how can I find some of those connection points with others? And how can we then translate that into a, a shared goal and a, you know, shared work plan? And, you know, also list, listening to Sabina's comments earlier, I always think about how everyone has a story. Everyone has a pretty interesting story. And, and also Sabina said earlier, you know, we're, we are at the United States, a nation of immigrants whether it was 15 generations ago or yourself. And, you know, the, being able to share those stories, I think you can start to find some of those common connection points. Um, and if not, maybe you can rally around, you know, sports is always a big one. I know Golden State Warriors, a lot of us have a lot of love for the Golden State Warriors. So, you know, try to find something that can, can, can bring people together as you're trying to work on some of these um, joint projects. Um, you know, the other thing I think about as I hear the other panelists speak though, is that there is always this struggle for power. So, you know, we think that, you know, as people of Asian heritage, we're always in unity. I, I can tell you within Thailand, there is very much uh, a lot of tension between, you know, where my father's from in Northeastern Thailand and Isan, and a lot of the Thai people who live in the capital city area, the Bangkok area, um, to the point where sometimes this tension has shut down the airport in Bangkok. And, um, you know, these are all people who are, uh, you know, of Thai nationality. And yet when I introduce myself, I still like to clarify that I'm Thai Lao, that I'm from Isan. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there's some pride for me in terms of having that be part of my heritage, but also, you know, for myself, if I ever find myself, you know, collaborating or potentially collaborating with someone from Thailand, I'll, I'll still try to find those connection points and try not to let some of this, you know, tension uh, make it impossible to work together. And I think with Black Lives Matter, we, 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 can, we, we can find a lot of common ground um, you know, my father, who is an immigrant from Thailand, he's, he's Asian, he looks Asian to, to the average person. And he, he, ha he faced some discrimination recently while he was shopping at Walmart in terms of people, you know, wanting to um, say mean things about coronavirus coming from China. And my dad's not even from China, but th this happens. And so I think that in this time period of um, you know, a lot of people trying to attack others because of the way they look. There's some common ground there. And I think that we can reach out to, you know, our, our friends in the Black Lives Matter movement and really be good partners um, in this effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Olivia. How about uh, Andy or uh, Scott? Any insights for us? 
Uh, okay, yeah, I'd like to agree with uh, Olivia. Is, uh, we need to build a uh, common ground and uh, uh, try to uh, unite as many people as possible. You know, it's, uh, we may think like here, you, I know the being from Pakistan, Olivia, you may originally like from my Thailand, uh, Scott, you have half uh, like a Filipino origin. Even Marsha is, uh, though you may think she's a Chinese, but we can say she's from Hong Kong, I'm from Mayland. You can further divide why there's no end. But to the outside, you know, they all ask, hey, you guys are all Asian. And uh, also, we are kind of going even bigger, we are all minority or colored people. And uh, this is why I say I like to build as much coalition partnership as possible. And uh, another thing I do is this, my principle is I respect other people. And regarding their race, gender, or uh, sex preference, whatever, religions, because I respect them, they will respect me. If you don't respect them, and how can you expect others to respect you, right? And uh, I know some people maybe from uh, some part of the world, they don't like, uh, like some API, they don't like uh, African-American. They think that they are like API is above that, but you know, they put API up below the white Caucasians. So what point you think you're the second group? I say, no, I'm the first group along with other, all the other people. So this is my point. We need to respect other people and uh, build a partnership. You know, we have our strong parts and uh, also we have our weakness and they use our strengths to help other peoples and uh, we'll get help when we run into uh, issues or problems. Mm -hmm. How about uh, uh, Scott? Any input from you? Sure. So, you know, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion really is one of my top priorities. I, you know, in, in listening to everybody, um, I think it starts with understanding that race relations is not just about the color of our skin. Diversity brings an abundance of ideas and talents garnered from a variety of life experiences and cultures and gives the needed perspective, right, of building and strengthening a community. So I think that, you know, I mean, if we look at, we look at regarding, you know, uh, uh, the murder of George, George Floyd and, and many others, obviously, you know, this is something to where, it, it, you know, we, we, we obviously could choose to be silent, but it's, it's something we, we don't want to be silent about. Um, but what we want to do is, is, is come together and, and basically flood the community with culture. Right. I mean, there's nothing better than to learn more about one another. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's good to find our similar similarities and we, we spend a lot of time looking, looking for how we, we, we are, are similar, but it's okay. And it's great to celebrate our differences. Right. Um, and I think that celebrating our differences is, is the way to building that harmony. Um, and I think we need more of it in our communities. Um, and I think that this is the, this is the, um, the, 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 the friendliest way of coming together um, and, and learning about one another, because the more we are educated about one another, uh, the less problems we're going to have and the more mm -hmm. we're actually going to appreciate one another. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So uh, there's a comment from, our, uh, from the audience, uh, uh, Lynn. Uh, who is um, uh, the ch uh, Papa chapter leader from Seattle. Uh, That's what she said, uh, that uh, we held a community discussion uh, panel with Black community leaders this summer. Some of the remark, um, uh, I think what she meant is stuck with us were to start small, uh, even sharing a thought in harmony that release tension for both volunteer together at an event so for all of you uh, you being uh, 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 leaders in um, your area would you uh, be holding a community 
discussion panel uh, in regard to this matter? So I think, Marsha, as leaders, we have to put ourselves, number one, at a higher standard. Uh, we understand our communities more than anybody else better. We know the deep biases that exist for a variety of things, right? Um, whether it's other, you know, other races, whether it's ethnicities, whether it's, you know, LGBTQ, we know all of them more than anybody else. And, and how do we as leaders embrace that and own that and then make sure that we are constantly talking to our communities as well as, you know, across the communities about these issues, not sweeping them under the rug, because that, that is the worst thing that you can do that pretend it's not happening all around you and you just keep going on. So one, we have to embrace and own it and, and stand up for all sorts of people that live in our community, whatever their culture, whatever their sexual orientation, whatever their ethnic background is. And so having this actually, um, interestingly, at the same time, Sanremon has a diversity coalition, which is meeting tonight as well. And that's been progressively growing uh, where the goal is to listen right now. The goal is to really listen and hear what's going on in our communities. We, we cannot pretend that we know somebody else's pain. Listen to what our students have experienced in classrooms, uh, listening to what our residents have experienced through uh, living in our communities. So for me, that is an important part that, that we create the space where people feel okay to share. And something that Lynn said, um, it starts small. It really starts, it might just start with your, you know, picking up the phone and calling your friend and saying, I really want to understand how you were impacted living in this city or in this country and what is one thing I can do to make this better for you. And that's really, I think, where we, we want to start and we want to build up um, to maybe, you know, a year from now, this panel is about bringing in uh, more, you know, more people to this panel and talking about and hearing their perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, starting small and not ignoring what's going on. Uh, I think this uh, racial issue has, uh, has been, it, it's just like um, elephant in the room is there, but no, uh, not many people want to talk about it. So I'm so glad mm -hmm. today that, um, that uh, political leaders like yourself uh, is willing to take this on. And, and yeah. so, yeah, and, and Scott? Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, I, I, that comment is, is a great comment. And I think it holds a lot of weight and it makes a lot of sense, right? Because what can we all do, right? We could, we could all uh, you know, volunteer. We could all start start with with baby steps, right? We can get involved into in, in one of those uh, one of your local uh, cultural events, right? Um, just volunteer for for an afternoon. Um, get to know others who are involved in that event. Um, I, I, I mean, absolutely, I think it's it's important. And as you get involved in your community, you have to start. <clears throat> excuse me. You have to start being a better listener. Uh, kind of, you know, basically, you know, what like Sabina said, and you have to be become basically more compassionate than you ever have been in your life. So being a great listener and being compassionate and, you know, again, starting small, I think is, is definitely the way to go. And it's something we can all do. It's this is, you know, these are these are simple things that we could all do. Right. Like like uh, like that comments suggests. Mm -hmm. We can start as a small, also as a leader, and uh, we can lead by example, outreach to other community. Uh, I still remember last year when I was in DC, uh, I had a one hour meeting with uh, NAACP uh, National West President in his office, and uh, we have very great conversation. Also, you know, try to build a friendship and do, build a partnership really helps. Uh, I like to use one of the example we had, what happened in the Sermon Valley. You know, there were one time once uh, Chinese students uh, post a video is uh, about, I mean, anger the Muslim community. 
those two community kind of throw in the nasty word fight on the social media. And, uh, you know, I know Sabina really well. We're good friends. So we had a coffee together. We had a very good conversation. And then we learned out is, uh, you know what? This uh, boy, he created that video. And uh, actually, he created a video with two Muslim young boys. And uh, they created together. And then I asked Sabina, I think Sabina, if you remember, is I asked her, if those two boys at that time, they didn't feel offended, how this. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, Marcia? Uh, yes, Andy? I think Andy's frozen. Um, okay, maybe. and uh, how about you, Olivia? You have something uh, to say yeah, about I'm that? conscious of our time and I see we have a really good question in the chat that I actually would love to address. Yes, I was looking at that too. Why don't you address that? As, yeah, this is something very close to me because I actually was... Oh wait, uh, Olivia, can you say the question and... Oh and, sure, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, um, but there's two parts from two different people. There's one uh, about the model minority myth and how it may have created dangerous identity politics, pitting APIs against the black community. And then a follow-up question to that, the second part about how um, we, the panelists feel about education and how we can better provide our next generation to recognize the importance of supporting um, this issue. And, um, you know, looking at this, you know, one of the um, reasons I actually want to get to this question before, you know, our time is up mm -hmm. is, I was a part of the final class, um, the final University of California class that was admitted under uh, affirmative action. So back in the 1990s, we had Prop 209 that um, told the University of California and the other public universities within the Cal State University system in California that admissions could not be based on race. Um, and so my class was the last one admitted under that. And then after my entry into the University of California, that was no longer allowed. And I, I went to UCLA in Los Angeles. You know, I, we actually just had the Newsweek results come out. We're the number one public university in the United States, second year in a row. Um, we beat Cal, which is always great. Go Bruins. Um, but we're in Los Angeles. You know, Los Angeles is one of the most diverse cities in our country and should absolutely, I, I do believe UCLA should reflect the Los Angeles and the California community. So Los Angeles not just being diverse, but California also being diverse. And you could see after Prop 209 and after the end of affirmative action, you could see that the number of, you know, African-American and Black students who were admitted to UCLA continued to go down, down, and down. Um, and there was one year where there were very few um, persons of that background who were admitted into UCLA. And I think that that is a it, that's tragic and that should not be happening at our top public institution here in California. I, and with that, on the flip side, while I was at UCLA, I was an SAT instructor and the, at the time through the school lunch program at the state of California, we were able to offer SAT classes to uh, the top high school students who qualified for the school lunch program. And through that, I ended up teaching classes at George Washington High School in Inglewood, California. Um, among notable alumni of this high school includes Ice Cube. Um, and as you can imagine, that, that school was predominantly African-American and I, I taught the math and English portions of the SAT preparatory program. And I can say it was a real struggle from the perspective of being able to teach these, these were the top high school students. And it was so difficult to teach, you know, how to add, multiply, subtract, divide fractions, things that I, I felt these students should have known by that time, especially if they're the top students in their school and they're taking these SAT prep classes. And I did have an opportunity to talk to one of the teachers about this. Um, and the teachers said, you know, these, these students do try hard. They want to do really well, but there's something that's broken at that K through 12 um, level. And this is LA Unified. So I know each school district um, is going to have its own set of concerns, but this is another area where I think we, as you know, members of the API community, as elected leaders, we can continue to support these efforts up and down the state of California to make sure that we do have, um, you know, 
quality of education at the K through 12 level and that we do prepare these students so that they can go to our top universities and get the education that will really help them, you know, climb up and um, have opportunities in front of them. Thank you, Olivia. Well, given the time, I would like to um, give all of you a minute, actually. So what is the next step? What is uh, the future that you see in, in uh, regard to you being API um, elected officials? Um, and what do you, uh, what actions uh, in the future are you uh, going to promote or create racial harmony? Olivia, you want to go first? I think one of the best things I can do, I, I have this goal this year to start a blog or something online where I can share, you know, all the information I have specifically within water issues and thinking about droughts and uh, floods and managing for floods. I, I know I have a lot up here that I would like to be able to share more publicly. And I, I think that actually could be very valuable because, um, you know, at least from the API perspective, when I go to our California water conferences or um, some of the other different organizations in regards to managing California water, I don't see um, quite as much diversity as we might even have at the city level. And so I think by establishing myself as someone who's knowledgeable and who's a part of this conversation, that can really help show that um, you know, amongst the API community, we all have a diverse set of interests and really help keep us you know, with a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about Andy? I know okay, sorry, I back. have some technical problem. I had like a 20% okay. battery, all of a sudden it shut down. So maybe Wait. I can- Sorry, in about a, min uh, in a minute. Uh, what I have one more minute to finish that part. Okay. Oh. Go ahead. So, you know, I talked with Sabina, we both aside understand, you know, that uh, student apologized, we saw that video. And uh, I think after that, you know, we're friends, we talk. And uh, after that, she, Sabina won't talk with her uh, community. I may talk my community, you know, these things is, is turned out to be a, not like a big deal. It's, uh, we tried to stop the fighting. Ooh, nice cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is, what is the future that you envision and what's action plan? Okay, uh, what I see in the future is I hope, you know, as an API, we can help more API and uh, move up, become a leader at different level, political level, business level, you know, this is where we are doing really hard in the Tri-Valley. Also, we like API to all go out, work with other community, and help others and we can all respect each other, cooperate with each other, create like mm -hmm. a harmony society we can all enjoy instead of, you know, we all fight. <laughs> Looks like a very good plan. How about Scott? So again, I, I wanted to say thank you to everyone for, for this opportunity to be here today. Um, it, it's an important conversation that needs to be uh, done uh, over and over and over again. Um, you know, I, 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 I believe that we need to do a better job of encouraging people from different backgrounds, those who are silenced, marginalized, and pushed aside, uh, and women and girls to find their voice and use it. Getting involved at the community level is where I started, but where I see myself uh, going forward is is really empowering other APIs. I've seen what it can do for you when you uh, get involved, right? I can see that when you get involved, your voice will start to be heard. So because of this, I'm going to continue to 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 encourage APIs to do, you know, like someone said earlier, uh, start with the small things, even if it's to volunteer. But what that will lead to is, is, is you know, um, uh, getting involved in your community committees, commissions, uh, maybe even running for office, hopefully, right? So, so, so that's that's what I see. Where I see myself headed is to continue down my own journey, but at the same time, empower other APIs to do the same thing. Thank you, Scott and Sabina. Your last word. 
So I think what I've realized when I first started running, it was about being Asian and representing the Asian community and getting a seat at the table. Um, the more I've served in office and the more people I've met, I've also realized to understand my privilege. I come from an educated background. I come from a family which was well-to-do. And I think that gave me an advantage to get a seat at the table. I, you know, I come from a place where I, you know, I have a good job. I am financially in a good place. And that allowed me to get a seat at that table probably faster than some people that did not have the same privilege. And so how do I use that privilege to open the door for people that may not have the privilege? Um, an interesting example I wanna share is we, San Ramon went to district elections. I was very supportive of that. And one of the reasons was that with a community which is you know, almost 50% non-white, why am I the only one representing um, the, the, you know, a person of color or a person of Asian background? And so district elections have really allowed San Ramon. And right now we have 10 Asians that are running for office in San Ramon, whether it's for mayor, whether it's for council. Um, and I take that you know, as an amazing thing we've been able to do just by creating districts and creating those opportunities. When we were creating these districts, um, actually one of the black residents in San Ramon came up to me and she was not supportive of districts and I said, but do you understand that, you know, it took me two tries before I got into office. If it was districts, maybe I would have been better elected because I belonged to community. And she said, my dear, as a black woman, it's going to take me seven times to get elected to office. So that is a privilege you understand and you embrace. There was, there's another friend of mine who's from the Latina background, not grown up with the same kind of privilege. And she continued to struggle to get into office, to get, get on committees, to get on commissions in San Ramon, because she didn't speak like most of us did, because she didn't go to the leadership classes, because she wasn't exposed, she wasn't part of the circle that said, this is, you know, we'll mentor you to, to get a seat at the table. So I know with Olivia and my help, she was actually elected unopposed to an office because she's a smart girl. She's from Berkeley, but just because she was not, you know, she did not have the same privileges that we did. Um, it was unfortunate that somebody so smart could not get a seat at the mm. table. So for me, it is now important to embrace my privilege and how do I open the door for all communities as, as, as I own this privilege. Yeah, and, and, us, and oh, uh, Olivia, go ahead. Real quick, I, I see we have one more comment in the chat that I think really ties well to what Sabina just said too, you know, mm -hmm how can we use our power and our privilege to uplift, you know, others and uplift voices, specifically our black brothers and sisters. And I, I think, um, you know, we, we should continue to do everything that we've been talking about in regards to, um, you know, reaching out, having those conversations and, and, and really trying to understand, you know, what's the one thing that I can do to help right now. And then also using our positions to make sure that those those voices and those stories and those situations are not just men mentioned, but also that we're taking action on the areas that we can take action on. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that uh, we can use the Hoover uh, Meetup uh, um, opportunity. You can set up, uh, any one of you can set up a Meetup uh, uh, to continue this conversation because this conversation is so profound and deep. We just open up, uh, uh, it's only, look at the interest that we all have. So I would suggest Christian and Lynn and all the speakers go to Hoover and uh, start uh, a meetup about racial harmony. We'll see you in um, in um, the next few days too. There's so much going on and we definitely demonstrate the power of we. Bye.
Thank you.